another episode of Proactive Parenting, a show where I offer you judgment-free advice on how to raise value-driven children in a way that's right for your family, using the most current scientific research out there. I'm your host, Dr. Deanna Marie Mason. I'm a certified pediatric nurse practitioner, published author, and expert in child development. I'm also the mom of two fabulous teens, so I know firsthand how much misinformation is out there. And that's why I'm here. So grab a cup of coffee or tea and settle in. This is a safe space where you can ask questions and get real honest answers about how to raise kids in a way that works for your family. On today's episode, I wanna talk about some shocking findings about cyberbullying amongst tweens and teens that was recently published from a survey conducted by the Cartoon Network and the Cyberbullying Research Center along with new research from the Journal of Pediatric Healthcare on bullying and what can be done to address it. So with all this new information coming out, it seems like it's a good time to go over what bullying looks like today, who is it affecting, and what can be done to protect our little ones. So with that, let's get started. Studies from the last 20 years have clearly shown that childhood bullying is a public health issue that negatively affects victims, the perpetrators, and the bystanders with both physical and psychological impacts that are long lasting. We know that nearly a quarter of our children are affected by bullying. And since bullying comes in many forms, frequencies and severities, we know that it can hurt children in many varying ways. Bullying is so prevalent in today's society that the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending that we start asking children about bullying at age six. Yeah, I said age six. And that may seem early, but the research is showing that some of our little ones have developed aggressive behaviors that have not been addressed and that can mean that they bully others. If you want to know more about aggressive and hurtful behaviors in small children and what you can do to help your child develop more appropriate behaviors, I encourage you to listen to my episode 11 podcast on that specific topic. Now, aggression, both physical and verbal, or even if cyber-based, is exceptionally harmful to our kiddos. We know that children who bully are more likely to experience depression and anxiety, abuse substances, and have poor social interactions and lower academic performance. And in more extreme cases, bullies have higher rates of criminal behavior and other forms of violence than children who aren't bullies. It's important to understand if a child who bullies is being aggressive against one or more children because Children who bully many different children are at high risk for negative social development that may follow them throughout life with their intimate partners, their work colleagues, roommates, and people in society in general. So therefore, the identification of children who bully is a very real issue that we need to actively address as parents. I know it can be hard to see this side of our child but failure to do so may set them up for lifelong difficulties that that could have been prevented. Now, studies on children who are victims of bullying have shown that they're prone to severe depression, social exclusion. Um, This happens because no one wants to be associated with them for fear of also being bullied. And they're also at risk for negative self-evaluation because the bully makes them question who they are and their value as a person. And more recent research in tweens has revealed that the effects of cyberbullying is affecting their physical health as well as their mental health. We can see this with stomach pains, headaches, or just general malaise, just not feeling good and not being able to put their finger on it. So it's not just a mental health issue, but it's also a physical health issue. And depending on the type of bullying, whether that's physical, verbal, or cyber, and if the person who's bullying them is a single individual or if it's a group of children, all that's going to influence how a child is affected. Interestingly, if a child is being bullied in multiple ways by multiple children, 
which is something that we call polyvictimization, um, they're at high risk for trauma symptoms such as anger, anxiety, depression, and nightmares. And once bullying has morphed from kind of a difficult situation to a trauma experience, the manner to address and support that child who is a victim changes in profound ways. Therefore, it's always better to learn about what's happening early so that interventions can be started before the bullying becomes a traumatic experience. And of course, we can't forget about the effect of bullying on those children who witness it. Seeing a culture of bullying and aggression, even if that child is not the bully or the victim, influences how our little ones see the world. Children who witness bullying may find themselves becoming afraid or stressed. And there is a psychological toll to seeing aggression as a commonplace thing. It makes the world seem unkind and scary. So when our kiddos are afraid of the world or they feel like it's unsafe, then they're less likely to be outgoing, to try new things, establish new relationships with others, or get involved. So even if our child isn't bullying other children or a victim, the effects of an aggressive environment may be affecting how our little one perceives the world around them in a negative way. This means that all parents, regardless of what is specifically happening with our child, should be interested in addressing bullying and aggression in children and adolescents. We all have a role to play in addressing this public health problem. We want to start by asking our children early about bullying because we know that repetition and frequency increase our kiddos' risks of negative outcomes. Additionally, if the bully is more powerful or larger, it also adds risks. So when our children are little, they have a higher chance of being bullied by larger, more popular, or older children. And of course, we can't forget about sibling bullying because there are clear power differentials in families amongst children, especially in blended families where children from previous relationships start living together. So what's the best approach to start to address bullying with our children? What types of questions should we ask and how do we do this in a way that our children will open up to us and share their experiences with us? Well, the best way is to create a safe space where we communicate that we're open to hearing about whatever they have to say and giving them space to share their thoughts and experiences. Asking big open-ended questions that aren't loaded or are going to make them feel that they have to answer in a specific way are generally considered the best approach. So let me give you a couple examples of what those questions could sound like. We could say something like, sometimes kids your age say that other kids tease them or say bad things about them. Has something like this happened to you? And we wait for the answer. If they answer yes, we could just follow up with something like, tell me about that. Another example could be, have other kids tried to hurt you or bother you? Again, if they say yes, well then we can just again follow up and say, tell me more about that or tell me about that. Now, while these two questions um, are kind of more focused on if our child is being a victim of bullying, it's equally important to check to see if our kiddo is actually doing the bullying. I know that we never want to think that our child would do those sorts of things. But the reality is that someone has to be doing the bullying if we have so many kiddos being the victim. To really address the issue of bullying, we have to work on both sides, the bully and the victim. Only looking at one side of the issue will not create real change. So we have to check in to see if our child has aggressive behaviors. And how do we do that? Well, the best way is by directly asking. In this case, we could say something like, do you ever hurt or say mean things about other kids? And again, if they say yes, we should follow up with, tell me about that. With all these questions, there's a lot of follow-up that needs to happen, such as, 
Is this child from the school, the neighborhood, home, someplace else? When did this happen? How often does this happen? Is it one child or many children, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, the key is to have our little ones trust us enough to share this information. Without that base, the information will always be incomplete. Now, a few years ago, there was a new development that was revealed about digital self-harm. Although we haven't talked a lot about cyber bullying, that's really a large part of what's happening today because of children's use of social media and online platforms. And this new development revealed that there was this evolution in that kind of bullying, that cyber bullying called digital self-harm. And the Journal of Adolescent Health and the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Nursing both published quite a few studies on adolescent self-harm, and this gave new insight to what was happening with cyberbullying. The researchers discovered in, this, in these investigations that some tweens and teens cyberbully themselves by opening up multiple social media accounts, like Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, so on and so forth, and bully themselves. In the research, this type of bullying was defined as posting, sending, or sharing hurtful content about oneself anonymously online. And sadly, they found that children who engage in digital self-harm or self-cyberbullying uh, are at higher risk of suicide later on. And they found some profiles of what types of children would be doing this type of bullying. Children who digitally self-harm usually have been bullied by others in the past, either in real life or online. And it appears that slightly more boys than girls engage in this practice. When these children were asked why they do it, some children said it was a way to express their self-hate. That's so sad. These kiddos often had a history of self-harm in real life, such as cutting, scratching, or hitting themselves. And for them, digital self-harm was just another way to make their inner pain become real. Other children said they did it because they felt depressed or suicidal and that they felt alone and isolated. So for them, self-cyberbullying was just a way to express their feelings and needs. They felt like it opened up a way that they could go to an adult and express their sadness and feel that they would be listened to and understood. So really, for them, it was a way to reach out for help without having to direct, directly share how sad and alone they were feeling. For other children, they said that self-cyberbullying, they did it so that they appeared to be victims. They did this to justify their cyberbullying of others with the intent to draw away attention from their own bullying activities. And then there were a few kiddos left over in the study that said they did it because they wanted attention, they thought it was funny, or they just did it because they were bored. It's important to remember that no matter why a child would engage in self-cyberbullying, we need to be aware that this is going on because at the heart of all of the reasons that they gave for engaging in this practice, all of the tweens and teens were looking for connection with others. It's so important that our kiddos can come to us with their concerns, doubts, and feelings, and know that we're there and open and willing to listen and understand them. The more we can help our children feel secure and safe in real life, the less they will feel the need to present themselves negatively online. We also know from the research that self-harming activities are generally associated with feelings of powerlessness or having a lack of control in certain environments or situations. By empowering our children and teens to reach out to adults to find real solutions, that may help reduce their desire to act out in self-harming ways on, in online environments and feel connected and loved in the real world. This information on digital self-harm or self-cyberbullying is especially important right now when our kiddos are so isolated and everything that they used to take for granted has changed. The COVID-19 pandemic has created the need for more education platforms and for children to study online. And with this change, the risk for cyberbullying may increase.
the unmonitored and unregulated digital platforms that our kiddos use for personal and educational purposes during quarantine or social distancing are just ripe for misuse. Some recent data coming in from the Cyberbullying Research Center shows that when smartphone and social media become ubiquitous for students, cyberbullying rates go up. And this happens because the number of potential targets and aggressor becomes almost unlimited in online platforms. And some tweens and adolescents will suffer silently because they are, there are no external visual cues that something is going on that would be the case if they were attending classes in person. So getting to the root of what's happening is the best way to address aggression in children. And we know from the research that kids want to talk to us about this topic as long as they think that we're going to listen and take them seriously without overreacting or overreaching. And some new data that was uh, just published this week shows that 60% of kiddos who are being cyberbullied electronically blocked their aggressor. This shows that this group has developed resources for dealing with aggression in electronic environments. And at the same time, this group that blocked, more than half of them shared what was going on with a parent, which means that they're also ready to reach out for support from trusted adults. However, our kiddos were less sure of what to do to prevent cyberbullying. Many times they thought that interfering with what they had seen online was just going to make it worse, or that they wanted to do, to do something, but they didn't know what to do or say. And some felt that trying to step in when they saw cyberbullying would actually open them up to be made fun of, which prevented them from doing anything out of fear. However, there are some suggestions of how we can help our children manage these increased risks and prevent cyberbullying from a broad social environment perspective. We don't need to leave it all up to them. There are four things we can do right now to help prevent bullying, which includes we need to teach the values of tolerance and empathy. We can help our kiddos see that the world needs every type of person. It's going to be easier for our kiddos to be open to others and the differences between individuals if they have a good understanding of their own emotions and are able to self-regulate when they have strong emotions so they don't try to process their emotions through others in the form of bullying. And of course, we need to be good role models as well. If we speak well of others and limit our judgment, our kiddos will pick up on this example and skill and start to include it in their own lives. Another thing we can do to bring awareness to what bullying is and how it happens with our kiddos from a young age is to talk about it. It's really easy to ignore that it's happening or pretend that it doesn't, but we need to bring a face to it and we need to show how it happens from very young children all the way through teenage kids. It can be very easy for our children to think that low level aggression is normal because we see it on TV, in the community, and sometimes even at home. So we can ask our children to share their point of view when they see something out of line. And while we want to avoid interrogating our children, tweens and teens um, we do want to point out examples when words become hurtful and show how the same message can be sent in a more respectful way. Of course, the family unit is the best place to model this behavior for our kiddos. Seeing how parents can disagree but respectfully communicate is a powerful message. We can also do this with our children so they grow up with a strong example of how to respect others even when our tempers or emotions are activated. Another action we can take is to notice and try to reduce all types of aggressive behaviors. Parents should not tolerate hurtful behaviors in any form, including hitting, threats, and domineering behaviors. This includes between siblings, which is where our children learn and practice their first social skills. We should ask our kiddos about the feelings they're having when they have these types of hurtful behaviors 
and help them express their needs in a less aggressive way. Our caring, connection-based approach is a sure way to de-escalate the aggression in the moment and to guide our kiddos to more appropriate behaviors. And finally, we need to help our children improve their social skills. A great place to start is with teaching the golden rule. Treat others as you want to be treated. This simple rule touches on important foundational values such as honesty, kindness, patience, and self-control. Each of these values is necessary for children to socially interact with others successfully and avoid aggression or hurtful behaviors. In addition to these su suggestions to limit bullying and cyberbullying, the Cyberbullying Research Center has also offered advice for students who are working from home to support good emotional health and limit the negative effects of social isolation. They suggest that we as parents are patient with our children if they become irritable or frustrated because they're working on managing this new reality the same way we are. But they're not as good at hiding or redirecting their emotions as we are because they're still growing and developing. We should also allow and support our kiddos when they want to FaceTime or Skype their friends or use other socializing platforms because socializing and connecting with their peers is essential for their healthy development, especially when there's chaos and uncertainty around them. And finally, we need to encourage as much physical activity as possible. Moving the body is necessary at all ages to calm the mind and support cognitive growth. All these suggestions can help support our kiddos, but we can't overlook working with schools to determine the appropriate ways to create healthy online educational experiences and understand policies the school has made to protect our students. Even though we are totally saturated as parents with all of the competing demands on our lives at this moment, we have to include connecting with schools to open lines of communication and share what we're seeing at home so schools are aware of how our children are managing. I know this topic has sparked a lot of interest and opinion because it touches on values, rights, safety, and the happiness of our children. Bullying, particularly cyberbullying, is a multifaceted issue, and the goal of today's podcast was to give some perspective and understanding on why cyberbullying is bad for our kiddos and how online learning has increased risk for them. We'll be talking more about this topic in the future because there's so much more to explore. But if you have any comments or questions you'd like answered, please email me at my email address, deanna at proactiveparenting.com. And if you want to find out more about me and what I do, you can find out more information on my website www.proactiveparenting.com. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching for my name, Deanna Marie Mason, where you can also connect with other parents just like you. And finally, if you'd like to purchase any of my books or online courses, you can do so on my webpage. Again, that's www.proactiveparenting.com. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you found this episode useful and interesting. If you did, please leave a comment and tell a friend so they can become a proactive parent too. That's all from me for right now. This is Dr. Deanna Marie Mason signing off. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, take care and be well.